Okay, so we're continuing our class on the attributes of the church. And today we are getting to apostolic. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share. Okay, excellent. So as a reminder, uh, our four attributes from the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So um, today we get to apostolic, the last one, and I thought what better way, what better way to start than with a quote from Kierkegaard. Uh, this is actually one that's been kind of, kind of popular uh, on the subject of of apostles, uh, it's from the difference between a genius and an apostle. Uh, one of Kierkegaard's essays: A genius is evaluated purely aesthetically, according to what his content, his specific gravity, is found to be. An apostle is what he is by having divine authority. The divine authority is what is qualitatively decisive. It is not by evaluating the content of the doctrine aesthetically or philosophically that I will or can arrive at the conclusion. I am not to listen to Paul because he is brilliant or matchlessly brilliant, but I am to submit to Paul because he has divine authority. So Kierkegaard is reminding us here uh, that central to the idea of an apostle is authority, a divine authority that has been delegated to them. And so he uh, and he he reacts to a certain trend in his day, of people trying to reduce apostles, the biblical authors, to a human account of um, what you know. You say human reason, thinking about God can accomplish, and says no, we dare not eclipse the fact that they are speaking for God. And then uh, another rather humorous way to put it, uh, as a genius, Paul cannot stand comparison with either Plato or Shakespeare. As an author of beautiful metaphors, he ranks rather low. As a stylist, he is a totally unknown name. And as a tapestry maker, well, I must say that I do not know how high he can rank in this regard. Kierkegaard is making the point kind of humorously there. The point of Paul is not that he has more beautiful prose than Shakespeare, or that he's smarter than Plato, or that he was the, the best tent maker there was, it's that he's commissioned by God with a message. Okay, well, there's some Kierkegaard starts out, but now let's go take a look at what the Bible has to say about apostles and sketch that theme. Well, and I may, oh yeah, here we go, Hebrews. Hebrews 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. So I wanted to start by pointing out that Jesus is called an apostle. Jesus, we could think of as the original apostle. Uh, the words... Um, Apostle refers to somebody who is sent, a messenger, and Jesus is sent by the Father at, to reveal the Father to men. So in a sense, Jesus is the original apostle and the one through whom all the other apostles find any kind of meaning. And yet, I don't know if you've ever um, remarked uh, how interesting it is that Jesus himself didn't actually write anything or leave us any written record, uh, nor did he stick around to run the church on earth in his physical body. Uh, but instead, after ascending to heaven, he has, he commissions humans, regular humans, uh, to run the church. Maybe that seems a little strange, and yet it seems to be God's commitment that he is going to do his work through jars of clay. As Paul says, God is committed to working through regular human beings, and that begins with the first apostles. So Jesus is the original apostle, but he chooses others. 
Here's one of the, the uh, summaries of that from the Gospels. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. This is, this is already a great study in popular baby names from uh, the, turn of the, the turn of the first millennium AD in uh, Judea. Lots of Simons, and Jameses, and uh, Judases. Uh, so Jesus calls 12 apostles right at the beginning of his earthly ministry. Why? So that they might be with him. So the fact that the apostles spend time with Jesus is important. That he might send them out to preach already, even before, uh, even during his earthly ministry, Jesus is sending out the disciples to preach. He's not just doing all the preaching himself. Uh, imagine that. I'm told that they kind of have at the multi-site churches in uh, in New York, it, you never know which one Tim Keller will show up at so that uh, you can't just always follow Tim Keller around. And, I, you know, I just wonder, like, dropping in and you, you thought you're going to get Jesus, but it turns out that it's, um, you know, Peter or maybe not even one of the, maybe it's like Thaddeus, one of the less well-known apostles. But Jesus doesn't do all the preaching himself, and he gives them authority to cast out demons. So, uh, sp time, spending time with Jesus, authority to preach, and, uh, or, or commission to preach, and authority, uh, power over demonic forces, already here in this first uh, of apostles. This same idea is kind of summarized at the beginning of Acts. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So um, Luke starts by saying that he, the, in this previous book, he, he talked about what Jesus began to do and teach, which implies that the book of Acts is about what Jesus continued to do and teach. It's interesting, even though Jesus spends most of the book of Acts in heaven, Jesus is still at work. Just because Jesus is in heaven doesn't mean the work of the church is no longer accomplished by Jesus. In some sense, it's what Jesus is doing and teaching through the apostles. We have, we're also told that Jesus has given his commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles. So the apostles bring us the commands of Christ through the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, Building on that uh, time they've spent with Jesus in his earthly ministry, he spends time with them after the resurrection uh, so that they can be his eyewitnesses. One question we might ask is, what does it take to make an apostle? And uh, we could talk about this a lot. It does seem like there's different ways in which the word is used in the New Testament. Like there may have been a core group of the 12, but there, um, and there, but there may have been more broad and more loose ways of using it. But one angle we can get into what are the criteria that makes an apostle is the fact that, well, they're missing one at the beginning of the book of Acts because uh, Judas is no longer among their number. And so they have to pick a new apostle. And they begin by applying this criteria. And then once they find people who fit it, then they cast lots to see, to inquire of God's will. But here are the criteria. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So they're looking for somebody who's been with Jesus through the whole earthly ministry, all the way from the time Jesus was baptized until the ascension. Uh, that's the primary qualification. And what's the primary job of an apostle is to be a witness a witness to Christ's resurrection. You, you might already be thinking of the one great exception, if these are the criteria of an apostle, though, which is the apostle Paul. And perhaps this is why Paul refers to himself as to one untimely born. 
um, like a baby whose uh, due date is late. Uh, Paul takes a long time to uh, come around and he had his, but he, he had, he, it's not like he doesn't spend time with Jesus. He has a vision of the risen Lord and, and that's Paul's commission. So Paul is the last of the apostles who even he seems to admit is kind of irregular as an apostle. This eyewitness part is um, is emphasized in several texts. I've just picked here from one from Second Peter one sixteen, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. This verse really kind of brings out the contrast Kierkegaard was trying to make. They're not like uh, Plato coming up with um, a really brilliant possible mythic explanation for the cosmos. I don't know if you've ever read Plato's Timaeus, but it's pretty striking how he starts it. It's a, I mean, it's a long, it's a, presents a very complicated cosmological theory about how the entire universe came into being, you know, based on the different kinds of right triangles and the different elements and all these sorts of stuff. But he starts it out by saying, it's probably not possible for us to tell more than like a plausible story about how the universe came to be. We probably can't do better than that. We can't really have certainty. That's not how apostles work. They don't give us the best human reason can do from the smartest person, but their authority is derived because they saw Christ, they are eyewitnesses of his, ma of his majesty, and Christ commissioned them to uh, be his witnesses and representatives. Okay, so now we're going to re return to this text, which we've looked at before in Ephesians 2, our house of the church metaphor text, uh, one, one of several where the church is like a building, a house or a temple, really. Uh, and this time we're seeing how do the apostles fit in? So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Okay, so we talked about this metaphor before. We are the stones being fitted into this temple. It's a temple, but it's also a tree that's growing. Um, but uh, let's focus now on the foundation. Notice Jesus himself is the cornerstone. So Christ is preeminent in all things. But together with Christ in the, in the foundation are the apostles and the prophets. Which prophets are we talking about here? There's some debate. Uh, is this apostles as in New Testament, prophets as in Old Testament? I lean that way. But of course, there are prophets in the New Testament as well. And God has given, God gives the gift of prophecy and that's a big deal too. So maybe this is New Testament apostles and prophets, or maybe it's just prophets broadly. Um, but what's key here is to note that the apostles and the prophets, these people who bring Christ's commands, Christ's words, and represent Christ's authority are the foundation. It's a metaphor worth thinking about, uh, especially because one of the issues that we're going, that's going to be raised in the history of the church is what happens when the apostles are gone. Uh, what hap the can't, does apostolic authority cease in that first generation or does it continue? And there's a bu bunch of different ways to look at that. Um, for one hand, there's structures like Roman Catholicism, which sees some kind of apostolic authority continue, continuing to be embodied uh, in the church, especially through the Pope. We could go almost to the other, ex other extreme and think of charismatic churches where people have styled themselves as apostles so-and-so, so they still have apostles. So that's one, I'll highlight that just now as one question we have to raise. But here the apostles are foundational, which does seem to suggest that, um, of course, a lot of these other denominations that would say, well, we're not apostles in the same sense. Like there is clearly a way in which the 12 are foundational. This foundation is laid, the apostles contribute to the New Testament, which closes the canon, and so there's something final about that first generation and the, the primary responsibility becomes 
holding on to it and passing it down. I could have picked a lot of texts for this. The New Testament has a lot to say about holding to the faith that was delivered. This is from Jude. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So that uh, Christ is the ultimate expression of who God is. Uh, and so the teaching he gives through his apostles is a definitive teaching. Uh, our Bibles are finished with revelation and done. And so there's something finished and definitive. And that means that as the church moves forward, it's always looking back, looking forward to Christ's return, but for its authority, it's looking back. And each generation has the task of passing on that deposit and ensuring their faithfulness to what was delivered to the through Christ's apostles. And um, this is just another text that kind of underscores that theme from Ephesians 3, 4 to 5. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So now that I think about it, this passage does argue pretty strongly for prophets being specifically New Testament prophets here, because the prophets are here with the apostles uh, among the group of among the group of people in this day, this generation in which Christ has come, and to them has been revealed the mystery of Christ. In this context, Paul is talking about the union of Jews and Gentiles. That that particular mystery. So, just underscoring the fact that the apostles and the prophets are the ones through whom Christ reveals himself. So much so that, again, as I said, Jesus didn't write, write any book of the Bible. He, he was content to do it all through his apostles. Another aspect of the apostolic self-understanding from 1 Corinthians 3.9, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. It's a very striking claim to make that you're a fellow worker with God. Of course, Paul would affirm that God has the priority in that. Um, it, 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 would, it, would be, it would be one of those translations that seems right based on just the like roots of the word, but that like misses it in the connotation. If we were to translate, we are God's co-workers, right? Co-workers would sound much too mutual. And yet there is a mutuality here um, with God having the priority, but it, they, they are invited in to work with God. They, um, and so the apostles have this very high role uh, that God fills his commission through them. Uh, and then in 2 Corinthians 5.20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So they're ambassadors, they represent Christ, and God speaks through the apostles, that very strong language of God making his appeal through us um, and through the apostles appealing to people to be reconciled to God. Okay, so hopefully the theme of revelation and teaching has come through very strongly, but there's also a theme of authority that we want to emphasize as well. So this is Luke 22, verses 28 to 30. Jesus is speaking to his 12 apostles. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a very striking statement about the authority of the 12 apostles, one for each tribe, that in the kingdom of God, they have a role judging the tribes of Israel. And of course, if you remember in the book of Revelation, this foundation theme, the city uh, of uh, God, the new Jerusalem has, these, has uh, uh, the 12 apostles as its foundation in some sense. Uh, so continuing the theme of like, what kind of, what kind of authority do the apostles have? Matthew 16 verses 18 to 19. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. 
and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So this is a controversial passage. We're going to have to come back to this on a couple of points. We, it, you, some of you may be aware that the Roman Catholic Church interprets this passage to say, Peter specifically is given a special authority here, and this is Peter being um, commissioned as the first pope. Um, we will, I'm not going to get into all the details of this now, but I will just notice that there, there is some authority being given to Peter here. Uh, this language of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and that in some sense, the activity of Peter binding on earth and loosing, a binding, whatever, whatever is decided on earth also applies to heaven. It's strong language. Now, we should immediately go on to say, it's actually not only Peter to whom this is said. Uh, a little later on in John, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Very similar language. This authority is not just given to Peter. It's actually given to all the apostles. And in fact, we could ask some questions. To what extent is this authority given more broadly into the church after the apostles? We'll have to come back and talk about the keys later. But I just highlight it now to note the strong language of authority that uh, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. No doubt that raises questions. Again, we'll, we'll talk about this later in the course. But just notice the very important authority given to the apostles here that they act um, in, in God's stead, even in the sense of forgiving sins. It's very strong language. So let's do a little bit, though, of, of, of groundwork for the difference between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. We've talked about the apostles and their authority as revealing God. And I think one question that could arise is, what is the relationship between God's revealed word and the human beings who bring that word? Because how you think about that is going to have a big impact on how you think about the church. Just to give you one narrative. One narrative says, well, before we had the Bible written down, we had a community of people, God's church, uh, and these authorized uh, office bearers who uh, held God's authority. And so therefore, what's really primary is this community uh, uh, in which the Holy Spirit dwells, and it's only in that context that the written word has authority. If you take that approach, then perhaps you can go in the Roman Catholic direction of, well, scripture is great and wonderful, but you can but we need an infallible interpreter, and that's what the church is. On, uh, on the other hand, I think uh, a Protestant view would say, well, okay, yeah, the word, it may be only be written down, but the word is always there. God is speaking to his people, and then later it becomes written down. And it's really God's word that creates, God's creative word, which creates the community. And ultimately, the word is what has ultimate authority. And even those ordained and commissioned uh, office holders in the church are only have a uh, limited and uh, fallible authority under scripture's infallible authority. I want to think a bit about the relationship between the message the apostles bring and the persons of the apostles themselves, because I think it does help shed a little light on that. And this is one of the best texts for it, Galatians 1.8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one he to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. It's very striking that Paul includes himself in this curse. He is at least willing to hypothetically consider the possibility of what if an apostle uh, went rogue and preached a false gospel. And in that case, it's the message, the message God has given them, which really has the ultimate authority. Uh, and which judges the apostle rather than the other way around. And of course, if you keep reading in the book of Galatians, it's not entirely theoretical. Peter, uh, as I read Galatians, Peter isn't one of the ones doing the false teaching, but he is uh, capitulating to those who do the false teaching. He is not opposing them. And so in that case, he errs. Apostles can err, even Peter, uh, the supposed first pope. 
And uh, Paul says that quite clearly. Okay, that's just to lay some groundwork for themes we'll come back to think about, talking about the role of the word in the church. Um, but for now, just as just pointing that out to say this authority, this great authority the apostles given is nevertheless bounded by their faithfulness to the message given them by Christ. That's where their authority comes from. It's entirely uh, subordinate to the message. And it doesn't this just fit with the way Paul talks? There are so many times when he says, well, it's not the Lord who's saying this, but I'm saying it. This is my, this is my wisdom call, but this isn't divine revelation from Jesus. When was the last time, you know, we heard uh, the Pope speaking at cathedra say, this is not I, but the Lord. <laughs> that's not, that's not the, the doc doctrine, but um, Paul is quite clear that he, his authority is entirely limited to at, um, explicit revelation that he has received from God. Okay, so that's uh, the end of the slideshow and a, a basic summary. And uh, let me uh, stop the share here. Okay. Uh, looks like we have some time for questions today. Or thoughts or other comments. What what does that mean that what they found on earth will be found in heaven? What does that exactly mean? Yeah, we're gonna talk about that more because we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about what what kinds of authority exist in the church. It seems to be referring to some kind of decision making. Um, if you'll notice, it, the uh, it, um, uh, in in the context, um, well, I, I think one thing we could say is church discipline. Uh, decisions made about who in or out. I, we, obviously, it's very strong language. And it's, it's also a metaphor of the keys, which we need to think about and disentangle. So I, I guess I'm saying we're going to get into that more later in the course. Clearly, it's some kind of authoritative ability to make decisions. Some of it seems connected to preaching as well, that their preaching is with authority. Like when it comes to forgiveness of sins, uh, when they come and they say, uh, in Christ, your sins can be forgiven, they're speaking for Jesus and that has the, they're speaking for God in some sense. But yeah, we'll need to talk about that more. Jamie, I think it's possible to say about Peter that there is a kind of primacy of Peter among the disciples. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's called first, he's given all through the gospels, he's given a, a, a central position he, he takes positions that probably he shouldn't. Um, and then he's, of course, the leader. He's restored personally after the resurrection and then publicly to be the leader of the disciples. So uh, I, I think you can, you can grant that, that there was a primacy of Peter. Uh, see it in Acts 2. You see it through the first chapters of Acts. But as you said, it's certainly something the other apostles received and were expected to execute. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the, the verse from Galatians 1 is so critical because it really does say there is something higher than any human uh, engagement here. And it's the truth that we've been given. And if that's damaged, then it doesn't matter what you call yourself, you're, you're disqualified. Yep. And it's an eternal disqualification. So the seriousness of preserving that doctrinal integrity is, is so stressed. Not only there, but as you know, other places as well. So Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, maybe I missed something very, very basic, it seems, is that uh, why in the creed does it say that we're an apostolic church? Okay, yeah. Um, so, and I think that's part of where some of these are, many of these are big terms that are kind of loaded. When we did, we talked about Catholic last week, we talked about, it's kind of a loaded term. I think, 
if you're thinking especially in the context of creeds and what the creed was doing in 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 you could think a, writing a creed could be a pretty dangerous thing when the, the the creed of nicaea was written i'm not sure that the people who were there actually totally realized what they were doing uh, historians will tell you that actually athanasius made a lot more out of the creed than maybe they originally thought um that, that i don't think that they, they realized that they were writing something that people would be reciting in church uh, 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 uh 1500 years later but when but when they got to constantinople and they they edited the creed they didn't know they knew at that point what they were doing because they they had the model of nicaea and they wanted to be clear that they were not writing new scripture that they were not replacing like adding to the bible in writing this creed what they were because they recognized scripture's absolute uh, authority and didn't want to put themselves in that place so i think at least part of what apostolic is doing there is saying what we are doing is defining the faith we are um trying to summarize in order to protect the faith but what we're but this doctrine comes out of the uh teaching given to us by christ's apostles it it's a recognition of the authority the apostles and their teaching which for us is largely the new testament it's the authority that that has in the church and so especially you know most relevant in that context was in the it was uh against heresies saying that the son is less less than the father and not equal to the father uh and so they were claiming that um well, they were saying that uh, what we're doing is protecting the teaching that's given to us by the apostles. And these other teachings are not apostolic. They're not from the apostles. Uh, they're, they're heresies. So I think it's that um, authority to, uh, of the apostles there is expressing who Christ is. The, again, with the foundation metaphor, the, the apostles and the prophets are the foundation of the building of the church. It means that we're we're standing on what they what they said. Of course, you know, and again, there's all kinds of questions about okay, so how does tradition work, and um, and, and and that gets in, and that will get us into some of the different ways in which you might understand apostolicity like not every christian tradition might mean quite the same thing when it says that creed but all of them do mean uh that there is some kind of authority uh vested in the revelation that comes with the apostles and if somebody like you know arius wants to show up with a bright idea later um it's going to have to be tested against uh the revelation of christ given to us in the new testament through the apostles Jamie, during Jesus' ministry, he was constantly challenged about his authority. Yes. And contrasted with Moses. Would it be helpful to say anything about the contrast between apostolic authority and Moses' authority? Well, uh, probably. What what are you what are you thinking of here? Well, I I I I I think it's such a big subject, but it's it was crucial and the way the Lord seemed to approach it is you haven't understood Moses. Yes. I mean, he never questioned Moses' authority, but he questioned their understanding of it. Yeah. And so when you get into apostolic authority, you do get into the hermeneutic issue immediately um, about what do these things mean that the apostles said, but there was no question that God spoke by Moses. Yep. And there was no question in the apostles' minds that Christ was the Messiah that Moses predicted. Right. So that there was that unity of authority between the Old Testament prophets, to go back to your earlier point, I think that Ephesians text is mostly talking about New Testament prophets, but yeah. it's built on the foundation of an Old Testament promise that came through the prophets. And Moses was the mediator par excellence of the Old Testament. Well, of course, it is striking in the um, in the let's see where to go uh, in the, in the uh, Hebrews passage in Hebrews three um, that there's actually a comparison being made between Jesus as apostle and high priest and Moses. Mm -hmm. Now that immediately goes into a contrast because Jesus is the son and, and and the builder of the house. Interestingly enough, whereas Moses is just the, the servant in the house. 
Um, but it starts with a comparison that as Moses was faithful in God's house, so uh, Christ is the faithful apostle who right. expresses God. Yeah. Right. Right. So there's no contradiction. It's 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 no. critical no. Uh, promise uh, to be fulfilled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against ending a little early <laughs> since I have things to get ready for. Uh, and so if there's nothing else, I will close this in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this gift of your son as the expression of who you are, as the one who reveals you to us. And thank you for the apostles as well, that you uh, commissions these men to give us your words to reveal you to us, to reveal Christ to us. I ask that you would make us uh, diligent in uh, seeking to know you better according to their words. Uh, but I thank you also for your grace, for your forgiveness that's given through the apostles. And I ask that you would help us to flee from our sins this week and find refuge in you and in the forgiveness and grace given to us in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'll see you in worship. Thanks, Jamie. Oh. Thank you. Bye.